Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab Talk. I'm Sarah Wallace, and I'm the director of the lab. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Ari Melenciano. She's a designer, a creative technologist, and a researcher who's passionate about exploring the relationships between various forms of design and sentient experiences. She's a creative technologist at the Google Creative Lab. She's a professor at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications program, and she's the founder of Afrotectopia, which she'll talk to us today. Uh, her work has been supported and exhibited by many institutions such as Sundance, the New Museum New Inc., the New York Times, and the Studio Museum of Harlem. She's also a frequent guest speaker. Before I, uh, I hand it over to Ari, I just wanted to remind people that we will have time for questions at the end. And if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we will um, do our best to get to it. So without further ado, Ari, here you go, thanks. Hi, thank you, Sarah, for the great introduction. It's really nice to join all of you. So I'm going to share my screen and begin presenting. So um, <clears throat> electron media and design fluidity means a lot of different things to me. And it's uh, really the core of where a lot of my work has been. And um, in going through this, I'll then share how I've navigated being an artist and then entering the tech world and finding space and creating space that allows me to continue being an artist and then also creating space that is encouraging of community and of equity and just a uh, really exciting imagination. So um, Sarah, Sarah already introduced me, um, but also just to give more context, again, as I mentioned, at the root of who I am and who I've always been growing up, I've, I've identified very much as an artist and someone that just loves to create with whatever is around me. And I've grown to find that design and creative technology have been really great vehicles to bring my art into the world, whether it's in service of others and creating environments and spaces that contribute to the intentions in which I have or creative technology that allows for there to be a communication between the artist and the viewer and that it allows for interactivity and for manipulation and all sorts of ways to change the art. A lot of my work is rooted in research. So I'll share a bit about the research that I've done that has influenced some of my projects. Uh, I'm also a professor at NYU ITP, the program that I graduated out of and I feel like in being a professor, I'm also able to be a student because uh, I think just the best part of being in a classroom is you're always learning. Everyone in the classroom is learning. And for me, uh, designing a classroom is very much about creating a space for students to bring their own interests in and seeing how they navigate the tools that I share. So um, I'm gonna share a bit about my electromedia media practice, research and pedagogy, uh, and also Afrotectopia, how all those feed into Afrotectopia. Um, and so with the, my electromedia media practice, which is, uh, really just a, a term that I use to explore uh, or think about creative technology and how I've navigated um, creating work that is ideally interactive and responsive to human activity or sentient activity. Uh, and a lot of it started, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned, growing up as an artist, but just like a strong affinity towards technology, <laughs> but not really having much of an understanding towards it. And then, um, or not having much of a comfort towards it. And then uh, once I got to graduate school, I was learning a lot about physical computation in ways that I hadn't before and electrical engineering and creative computation. And so I finally had enough of the, the foundational tools to understand how to create the things that I was really excited about. And one of my favorite mediums is photography. And so I wanted to create a camera that blended the experience of some of my favorite aspects of photography, whether it's the convenience and uh, automatic uh, unveil of an image that you've taken with digital photography to the surprise and um, just spontaneity of film photography. When you take it, you forget the photos that you took and um, the cameras are beautiful in the way that they're designed. And sometimes you might have some defects in a photo like uh, light burns and film grain to the shareability of instant photography and using those um, like sort of Polaroid or Fujifilm cameras. I wanted to bring all of them together and create my own camera. And, uh, see what I could make of that. And so, as I mentioned, just loving the beauty of film cameras, which is something that digital cameras are finally starting to do. I was really exploring this stuff a few years ago. And at the time, digital cameras, they really had this like bulky 
for me, ugly design that DSLRs usually had. And then they eventually started to turn more into the film aesthetic with the digital camera, but really admiring just the, the aesthetics of these film cameras and deciding if I'm gonna create my own camera, I can really push against, push past everything that I was taught that a camera should be of uh, the way that it looks. It doesn't have to be this rectangular form. It could actually have a whole different shape, um, bring in some analog sort of elements of like film photography elements. So if anyone has ever seen a C3 Argus camera, this is very much inspired by that, but thinking about how I can bring that aesthetic in here. Um, thinking about the ergonomics of the camera. So I using very lo-fi material like cardboard, I would then print out the cameras of different sh shapes and sizes and then have other people hold them and let me know what feels good in your hand and not of thinking about how can I make sure that this is ergonomically sound. And then it was going into building it. So having uh, prior to this, a few months prior to this, I had not ever built something um, with an Arduino really. I, I, I don't think, or maybe I tried, but I had someone help me. But this was me fully doing everything um, by myself, which was such a huge uh, form of agency for me because I could finally have an idea and then manifest every part of it. And I, I really wanted to do every part because I just wanted to be able to, uh, you know, fully flesh out exactly what I had in my head. So it was bringing these different sensors, programming it using a Python to design the program of how this digital camera, it's actually a digital camera, will mimic the film like experience of randomly applying film like filters onto it um, and all sorts of things. And so this is the uh, casing of the camera. So then also designing what does the exterior look like. And a big thing for me was um, the fact that cameras are almost a sort of wearable technology of it's it's not in the same way that you might have sensors embedded in clothing, but it is something that you are putting on your body if you're putting on the neck strap. So why not make it something that's complementary to someone's outfit? Like a lot of the objects that we have, we buy them because we uh, they we see that they identify with us. Like we we find a similarity between their sense of style and ours. So why not bring some of that idea of style and fashion into something that is always seen as very uh, technical or artistic, but not really aesthetically pleasing in its form. And so then these were the photos that it took of um, immediately applying film like filters onto the photos uh, randomly with film grain or um, light scratches or just like dust and colorful and experimental. And the name is called Ojo Oro because uh, the idea was that it's uh, unveiling each person's golden eye, which is Ojo Oro translated to Spanish. So it's meant to be a tool that's experimental, it's fun, um, but it's uh, it's not about creating this perfect moment through that we do with digital photography. When you take a photo with your uh, phone, you can see it and then you want to perfect your pose. It's more of just be in the moment and enjoy it and then look at the photos later. Um, and so these are all just examples of different spaces that I was exploring, mental spaces. Um, another one is sound sculpture. So I've grown up loving music. I, I grew up creating music. And um, I was in, we were, as a student, I was invited to explore how to create instruments of entirely different forms. And so going back to physical computation, I would then create these sculptures that I would have in mind of that I'm gonna you know, infuse them with technology in different ways um, and turn them into instruments. But first I'm thinking about aesthetics, which is generally how I entered the arts of thinking foremost of how can I make something look really beautiful. That was always the goal as a, a, a kid. And then through this project, it was how to create something that's aesthetically pleasing, but then also how to make something that's aesthetically pleasing functional and adding that layer to it. So it was then bringing in all of these different sensors, weaving them into these sculptures and making it so that as you touch these different sensors, like the software potentiometer or light, uh, the phototransistor cells or um, all of these different sensors, they would then change the amplitude and the frequency of the sound. So it's creating a whole new way of doing sonic composition. Um, and so the culmination of this course was creating a performance. And so I was really excited about this because it was allowing me to create, uh, move beyond, for me, design is everything. And it's not even just the design of a product, but it's also the design of an experience. How might someone experience the product that you're creating? In this case, my product was the sound that I was producing on stage live. So I would perform live, um, creating a, a sonic composition with machines that I have built to create this on a composition and then also thinking about the video art that would be projected behind me that I would also create and then also the costumes and the lighting design. So I was really thinking uh, very intentionally about all aspects of this uh, and trying to create something that could be enjoyable for people. 
And at the time I had watched a movie on Jimi Hendrix. I was super inspired about just like the beauty of a rock and roll star of having that guitar on stage and how powerful that looked. So I wanted to create my own guitar, a sort of neo retro guitar that had the shape of a guitar, but the sensors infused with technology. So it's controlled by a variety of different sensors and it has a shape that's also a bit different and uh, kind of a bit more modern and um, geometric. And so this is the guitar that I fabricated and brought in some arcade buttons and some linear potentiometers and other potentiometers so that you could control the sound that's coming out of it. And then this is the beat machine that I created uh, where you can press the buttons and the other potentiometers and it would also control the, I was using um, Arduinos inside of these controllers, inside these machines, um, which then fed into uh, Max MSP and Ableton. So I was controlling and distorting sounds live on stage. And then this was presenting. Um, and a big inspiration for me about this project was I wanted to create something very culturally specific. I was using a lot of sounds from Black culture and uh, video pieces and creating a video, live video montage from uh, all things that for me felt like they were representing Black culture. And I wanted to create something that felt like it was a mirror to the beauty of the essence of Blackness. And so for me, that, that became a moment where I was finally able to not only engage in new media, um, but also to engage in a cultural practice that allowed me to bring in my interest into the work that I was creating. And I continued to do that. I did that for a while of creating these environments where I'm Comp composing music live, whether I'm DJing or using a bunch of sound machines, and then also creating a video experience, a projection experience, where I'm also DJing with different video feeds or creating sound interactive visuals that I've programmed in, whether it's P5.js of maybe it's text or it's shapes, or bringing in some lyrics and, and just like creating a whole collage on the walls around me. Um, and then I, I continued, I kind of bounced back and forth of creating these environments to creating these artifacts. And another series of artifacts uh, shown here, I was thinking a lot about um, Black culture artifacts of how personally, and someone that's grown up in a predominantly Black environment, how these Black cultural artifacts, I have, there's so much significance for me towards them. Like I really appreciate the way that they look and the way they feel and the way that they're worn on black bodies and how when they're worn on black bodies, they're often heavily stigmatized in negative ways. And how when they're worn on white bodies or Asian bodies or other bodies, they're kind of seen as these like cool things that don't have that same stigma. Uh, and so I really wanted to just take a look, at, uh, create, take a look at these artifacts and kind of recontextualize them of what do these artifacts look like out side of the gaze of communities that don't completely understand them, don't actually grow up with them and kind of monetize off of them because of their popularity, because of the coolness factor when they're not worn on black bodies and recontextualize them in a space where I'm thinking about the future of culture. Like what, what might it be the future of culture when we have severed the gaze, external gazes from the communal artifacts. And so um, that was this of by going to the beauty supply store, filling my cart up with a bunch of these items and then creating these sculptures uh, with a bunch of different colors and laser cutting and designing the, the Afro pics and making them functional. So again, it's this creating something that is aesthetically pleasing, but then also creating something that's functional in that uh, as you touch it, it for these, they're sound sculptures as well, as you touch the hair rollers or the do-rag or the bamboo earrings, they're actually triggering different sounds. And as you touch the Afro, as you, uh, change the Afro pics, which are infused with the sort of technological DNA um, and change, put, put a different Afro pic on that bed that I've created, it will change the visuals that you are seeing. So they're both sound controllers and also a, a video controller VJ device. And so here are more. And this one has hair with it, which um, was also an interesting experience in that oftentimes when we think about hair and culture, uh, specifically with Black culture, it's, there's no invitation. Generally, there's uh, there, there seems to be at times an assumption that you can just like go up and touch a person's hair, especially a black person's hair because of the texture of how intriguing it can be. Um, but that's actually very offensive to a lot of black people. And so it's creating a device that invites people to actually do it. It, it requires them to touch the hair, but it also creates this sort of um, mythology around it, around this idea that the reason why you can't touch black hair is because there's so much magic within it. And that if you do, then you then experience uh, by touching that hair, it then triggers different sounds and kind of creating, uh, recontextualizing, but also reimagining uh, the reasons why uh, certain things happen. 
And so it was continuing to build this. And so the, the projects that I'm presenting are kind of jumping in and out of the time that Aftertopia had been developed, but I'm gonna kind of just talk a bit about projects first and then jump into uh, how they fit into Aftertopia. So this was created while Aftertopia had already existed. This was created in 2020 um, called Metamorphosis. And so this one was a project that was very specifically rooted in a lot of research and then it, it turned into something experiential. So metamorphosis I created in the time of uh, the second wave of the Black Lives Matter uprising, uh, which was in 2020, same time as the beginning of the, around the same time as the beginning of the pandemic a few months after. And so just hearing a lot of being, being in my apartment, doing work like teaching courses or at meetings, um, Zoom meetings, but also listening to protests on the street of people chanting um, the different things that people in the protests were saying. I was thinking a lot about the effects of turmoil and pain on the body. Like not only is there a ancestral inheritance of pain and turmoil that um, I'm thinking specifically about black people and pan-African people have experienced due to racialized oppression, but there's also this pain that we're experiencing right in this moment. And so what is all of this doing to our body and understanding this idea of epigenetics, a scientific practice that explores how, explores the ancestral inheritance of trauma and pain and how that then alters DNA. I was thinking a lot about that and wondered if it could be possible to create a sort of positive form of epigenetics where it's not about trauma reorienting and redesigning your DNA, but instead it's actually forms of healing, using healing modalities to restructure your DNA. Like, could that be created? Which then goes into the idea of metamorphosis, which is thinking about the etymology of the word, this larger change by using frequency modulation. So using sound frequencies and researching how there are different sound frequencies that are aligned with different seven core energy centers, also in the chakras, and how I could use those specific frequencies also complemented with African drum pattern music and thinking specifically about talking drums and djembe, which were used in a variety of different Pan-African revolutions, specifically the Haitian revolution as a tool for communication, creating uh, soundscapes and then also visuals that were tied to different energy centers or chakras and ideally trying to create a, a web, uh, an online healing experience for that. So again, just going into the research, understanding, okay, what chakra then ties into what specific frequency and then also exploring different African drum pattern music of how can I blend the drums with this uh, drone sound of the frequencies. Then also thinking about the design of the environment, how might someone experience these sounds and these visuals that I'm creating. And so um, having been a student of architecture briefly, but exploring the practice of it, and then also just a, a hobbyist explorer of psychogeography and what psychogeography means, which is generally the correlation between your uh, psychological state and your environment. So how your the space around you impacts the way that you feel. So understanding that circles, circular shapes actually calm people down and wanting this to be a space of calmness. Um, brought that in, then developed the sounds, um, created all the soundscapes with all my different machines and synthesizers. Uh, then designed the environment. So again, thinking about psychogeography created a really high ceiling because when you're in the midst of spaces that have really high ceilings like cathedrals or just large museums, they're intentionally done to make you feel pretty insignificant and not in a negative way, but more of in a way to make you feel like you're in the presence of something great. And so I wanted people to feel like they were in the presence of something powerful. And then it was designing the space. So this ended up being a web VR environment where I 3D rendered the entire environment, spatialized the sound. So I embedded the sound into these different spheres that you see, or see that are all aligned with the different chakras. And as you move through, you're then able to engage in the different um, sounds and the sounds are spatialized. So you can only hear it when you're closest point to the chakra, to the sphere. Uh, and I continue to build off that. A lot of my work just explores how sound can be used, not in a traditional sense or not in a purely traditional sense of making rhythmic music, like um, rhythmic you know, work that would then be considered music, but also kind of just like soundscapes. So this, I use my modular synthesizer and created algorithms for my modular synthesizer to create soundscapes that were um, built. The algorithms were using the input data for the algorithms were the uh, data, climate data for these different five cities. And this was at the time when um, COVID had begun and, and researchers were finding that land, uh, that the air quality was a lot better due to less 
uh, commuting. And so I wanted to bring that in and really put a power to this idea of this new slower living, ideally, or less traveling, how beautiful that is for the earth and create a, a soundscape that would then reflect each of these different cities. So in this experience, you can go to this website which I think is like electrocology.glitch.me or something, can't remember, but I can send it later. And as you enter each different city, you see the landscape. I would just grab shots from Google Earth, and then you will be able to hear the soundscape aligned with the data from each city. Um, and so it's just been a nonstop of just creating these alternative worlds uh, or also alternative ways of interpreting the world that we live in. And this one was called an Alchemy of Celestial Florida de Legia that was selected for Sundance. And this was an environment where I was thinking a lot about the flora fauna world of uh, the life at the scale of flora and at a very extremely microscopic scale. And thinking a lot about the intelligences that our bodies and life has that are outside of the five senses that we most commonly tap into, but the sort of metaphysical worlds and the spiritual worlds and how that could be, how, how I could turn that into a sort of environment of visual experience. And so that's what the root of alchemy of celestial flora legia was, was um, thinking about the communication methods of sound and frequencies, like the radiation from one body to another, and how we could actually tap into that and create a whole new way of experiencing the world. Um, and so this just being another screenshot of a lot of my work since then has been how can I continue to use um, these different devices to create these experiments, experiences that are tapping into different parts of our senses or just allowing us to hear sounds or see visuals in new ways. And one of my favorite thing about the modular synthesizer, my setup with the modular synthesizer is that the different modules, I don't know if anyone has ever used a modular synthesizer, but when you go to the store and you um, build out your modular synthesizer rack, for only it comes empty, usually it does. You could also buy a, a pre-filled modular rack, but I bought an empty case and bought these different modules and the modules are actually called Euro racks, like E-U-R-O. And um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why they're called that. But for me, what excites me is the fact that how I've how you create your own modular synthesizer is very up to you. You buy the different modules based on the kind of music that you want to create. A lot of my work is polyrhythmic, which is very you know, very central to African drum pattern music because it you know, has a lot of different beats going on at the same time. And so I wanted to bring that element into the work that I was doing. And so the fact of being able to create this, being able to output African Afrocentric sort of music styles from a device that's called Eurorack. For me, it's constantly about how can I use the resources? It just symbolize, it's symbols, uh, it's symbolical for me of how, I, I feel like so much of my work is about how I can use the resources and the society in which I'm in, embedded in and the world around me. How can I use that to still bring in my point when it's so often rejected and kind of put into the outskirts? So using something that's clearly named of a different geographic location, but in the way that I'm, I'm using it, re reimagining its purpose and creating something of an entirely different world, I think it is um, a lot of what inspires me. And so then that leads to Afrotectopia, which has been a social institution all about imagining, researching, and building at the nexus of new media art, design, science, technology through a Black and Afrocentric lens. So I created this because I had gone to graduate school and um, from 2016 to 17, and my experience was incredible. I loved everything that I was learning, and um, it just was a whole new world that I had wanted for so long. I wanted to be a part of this world for so long. I didn't even know what existed, and just came across this uh, program, and it was life changing. And I was able to create work that I had had not even dreamed of. Both work I had dreamed of and had not ever even dreamed that it was that was possible. But I was looking around and there were extremely few black students and there was no full-time black faculty. And generally it was very desolate of any racial, uh, racial um, diversity, at least with like black and brown people. And so I was thinking about what would it be like if I had my friends that I grew up with, if they had access to this type of program or just people that I didn't know that were black, if they had access to this, because I wasn't seeing this as, actually that difficult. Like at times it could be difficult just to get the foundational understanding, but once you got that, it was so easy to really realize all of these exciting ideas. And so just knowing how black culture can be such a space of really vibrant innovation, I, I felt like it was critical to make sure that this is a space that black people can see themselves in. And also being a black technologist at the time or like being a budding one, emerging one, 
and not having a community of my own that I could build with and see what are they doing, like how are they bringing cultural elements into the work um, and thinking critically about technology, both in an aesthetic and artistic form, but also in an equitable and uh, a conscientious form of its design impacts. And so wanted to create an environment, a community that kind of solved all those issues of Black people would come together and they could learn about new ways that they could imagine culture, but through this different, these different mediums where Black technologists that are already in the field could have a community of people that they could build companies with and projects with, where um, people that would never even think of themselves as people that could be in this space now see themselves in this space because they see other people that look like them that are doing this. So it was realized in 2018 with a zero dollar budget. It was really just about a lot of begging and asking different university departments and companies to support this. And then it happened. It sold out very quickly after being announced. And it, I think for me, that was just very representative of how it was a huge void that we were experiencing. If there really wasn't a space that was thinking about art, design, technology, science, and also Black culture and racial activism in one space. And so it's continued from there, from being a membership program, a summer camp, uh, events, having multiple festivals, one at NYU and one at Google. Um, and so much of the space from the very beginning has been about how it can be a space where a lot of different people can come together. Though the name is called Afrotechtopia, which has tech at the center of it, it's not a space that's rooted in a traditional sense of technology. And I'll go into what that means in a bit later, but it's meant to be a space where a lot of people of different backgrounds can come together because what we're doing is we're ideating on what our potential futures can be. And when we're ideating on futures, it's really important that the design practice is as inclusive and comprehensive as possible so that there are as little blind spots as possible. So we had people like engineers and scientists and public policy advocates and artists and educators and lawyers and all sorts of people that could contribute their expertise since there are conversations. And so we can realize something really exciting as we're ideating and matching potential futures. And so these are just some images from um, the second and last festival, uh, after this, we had the pandemic and haven't done anything in person yet, uh, at least not on this at large of a scale, but this one was at Google's uh, space. And um, so we, we brought people were welcomed into the space and they uh, just shared ideas. And it was a really exciting moment too, because it wasn't always about this idea that we all have to agree and we all have to be on the same page. It's understanding that just because there, we have the same racial identity that we have very different perspectives. And so there was room for us to share difference in perspectives and to have these kind of conversations that were productive and respectful of each other, but also enlightening and that we can see a different side. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's taken a variety of different forms from the festivals, but also to pedagogical frameworks for adults. So we've had a summer camp for middle and high school students, but also have, ha have had adult programming like the School of Architopia, which was three weeks of courses um, hosted by Verizon. With, uh, and this was all in person. We had about 250 students actually attending these three weeks of courses, which was incredible because even on a Friday night, the classrooms would be packed of just people that were really excited about ways that they could learn about how they can bring in their cultural understanding with these mediums like art, design, technology. And really, it, it, we're teaching technology that's very much at the forefront of what's being developed, like doing things like projection mapping or uh, data science or um, you know, creating filters with AR devices, et cetera. And so this was, uh, I think this was actually on a Friday night. So just to see all these people giving up a Friday night, which is pretty precious, I think, to a lot of us of how they've been able to, um, you know, prioritize this and, and see that they can, uh, just having the access to this sort of learning. And so I'm going to uh, dive a bit deep into this Imaginary Fellowship that was created last year, um, because I feel like this project really gives a great understanding of what Africatopia is and um, this type of opportunities that's been able to give people. So the Imaginary Fellowship, uh, I created this because it was in the middle, it was towards the end of the first year of the pandemic. And so there was no, uh, I had no intention of trying to do a conference because for me, that just felt like a waste of energy to even try and figure it out and work around a pandemic. And for me, it was more of just let's, let's tap into the potential of people being very comfortable 
engaging online. Um, now Zooms are normalized and we're communicating a lot and how this can actually also be an opportunity for people that have wanted to engage with Afrotectopia but have not been in New York City because so much of our work has been hyper-local to uh, the city and you would have to travel to attend these events. Instead, it's more of how can we just bring this into the living room of people all around the world? And so it was, it was about a month and a half where 10 fellows were selected and each given $1,000 to join this fellowship. And really the, the whole task was about just being imaginative, creating ideas. So the fact that there's a fellowship that's just paying people just to come up and share their ideas, I think is also just a huge moment because it's such a, a shift from our traditional sense of capitalism and how it's very much about extracting something that feels immediately valuable. Whereas this, this might not have immediate value in the moment, but it's understanding that's an investment in the culture. And so in designing this fellowship, for me, I was thinking a lot about individualism versus community. And at this time, um, before working full time at Google's Creative Lab, I was doing a lot of work as a freelance artist and a professor at a bunch of different universities. And so much of the, the way I was able to sustain myself was very much through an uh, individual operation of being an artist, just doing a bunch of different residencies. And the way that the residencies were developed are you, you get paid as an individual to create your own body of work and how that really is, um, as, as amazing as that is and fortunate as I felt, it, I also was reflective on how it wasn't really a communal practice. And I think so much amazing uh, potential can come out of you know, more communal sort of work. So I wanted this to be a fellowship where it's not about investing in specific people and their individual practices, but it's more of it's, it's, uh, investing in communal sort of practice. And so at the beginning of this, it was also reflective of um, the, the main ethos of Afrotopia, which is an omni-specialization of if we're ever going to design a future or think about designing a future, we have to be comprehensive. And so as I interviewed maybe 200 different people that were interested, uh, that had rose to the top, about 100 to 200 people that rose to the top for the applications for this fellowship, and these are people from all over the world, uh, from different continents, I was intentional about making sure that I created a team of people that had a lot of different expertise. So uh, these are just a list of some of the expertise of the 10 selected fellows from people that were in digital humanities to um, curation, to machine learning, to ethnography, to textile design, to on the ground community activism. And then also being uh, intentional about the understanding that blackness is not a monolith. And so, as I mentioned earlier, even though we may have the shared racial understanding, that does not mean that we will have a shared uh, um, perspective, even through this shared uh, racial identity. So, and a lot of that perspective can be based off of someone's ethnicity or just a, a variety of other identity factors. So it was about bringing people in from around the world, but then also as far as the U.S., of different parts of the U.S., we have people from every section of the U.S., from Northeast to Southern U.S., to the West Coast, to Northwest. And so also people of different ethnicities, like a Black British person, West African, Mexican American, French Canese. Uh, Beninese or Haitian and Afro-Cuban. And then, as I mentioned, it's not only about their ethnicity identificators, but also their sexual identificators, their economic identificators, like being first generation Caribbean American or being queer or being trans or being um, uh, cisgender, working class, uh, whether it's had only gone to high school or was in the midst of the PhD, we really had uh, a full spectrum. And so then as I um, introduced these fellows to Afrotopia, none of them had really been, most of them had not been a part of the community. So a lot of these people were new to what Afrotopia was, but they had heard of it, which is why they applied. But I wanted to make sure that they understood that when they're engaging in this sort of work through an Afrotopia lens, that at the root of this and the initial, one of the most important understandings to initially understand is that Technology for Afrotopia and from my personal perspective is merely an extension of human capability. And we can often see it as something that's a lot more uh, specifically robust to computation and digitality. But when we look at technology as merely just an extension of our capability, it is uh, it, it really unveils the potential of it, of how we can really uh, infiltrate our lives and impact us in ways that we hadn't thought of or how it is and the ways that we haven't recognized it before. And then I also mentioned how technology is merely an extension of sentient capability. So when we get out of this human-centric way of identifying the world, 
it's not purely humans that are using technology, but it's every sentient being that's using technology. Everything is evolving and changing in order to better uh, equip itself for its circumstances. And so when we understand that, uh, how butterflies are engaging in the form of technology and how ants are and, and every living thing, trees are, um, we're be better able to understand how we can mimic these advancements that other sentient cultures are doing and use them as uh, examples for our own practice. So the objectives of the fellowship, which has been the objective of Afrotopia, uh, I feel like this fellowship is very much a kind of microcosm of Afrotopia at large. And so object objectives include building a vibrant international and multidimensional black micro community of innovators. So it's about really gathering a group of people that have a variety of different fields from a variety of different fields and coming together to build with one another. It was to contribute to and create healthy visions of black futures. So, uh, and just understanding the cultural experience of being black, especially in America, but also worldwide, of the constant bombardment of a variety of different forms of oppression. Uh, it can be very difficult to even have the opportunity to imagine the future and what does that mean? And to give yourself that space to think, to not think about your immediate concerns of how you're gonna pay these bills or how you're going to um, push back past this new law that's being enacted. And it's not so much about an immediate concern, but it's actually taking a step back and looking about your, your experience, but also the generations behind you's experience and, and trying to create these visions of what does it mean to live in a healthier world. And so creating that space specifically for Black people that are often even rejected that opportunity to do that in a group of people and to do that in a way that's prismatic, meaning that it's diverse, that it has a lot of different fields and a lot of different identities that's being built off of. It's also, an objective is also to develop open source interdisciplinary pedagogy. So, so much of Afrotopia, whether it's been accessible through extremely subsidized or just free tickets, um, and then sharing it online so that it's not just the, the immediate people that have been inside that space or inside of that environment, Afrotopia environment, that get to benefit from it, but that it's something that anyone that knows about Afrotopia or discovers it can also build uh, with the work that we've done. So all of the work that the fellowship fellows did, we shared it online for other people to be able to use. And I think at the core of Afrotopia, especially as I mentioned earlier, of like trying to create something at the center of uh, an extremely capitalist world, uh, there's not much room uh, in nurturing for imagination. And to create a lot of the work that Afrotopia has done, it hasn't been something that fits into a, a business model that you traditionally see but it's actually a business model that's about investment in cultural advancement and moving the culture forward and the needle forward for people. And so a lot of that's planting seeds that I or anyone else that has helped me in building Afrotopia may never actually see the, the flowers and fruits of, but understanding that it is something that's impacting and doing, creating large uh, ripple waves for the advancement of people going forward. And so these are some of the fellows, uh, these are all the fellows actually, 10 of them, and it was really exciting. Just, it's just such a special moment to work so intimately with a group of people that generally none of them knew each other. And they had all come together for the first time. We were all getting to know each other through Zoom. And they were coming from all over the world, from every part of the USA to UK, to Ghana, to France. And um, the first thing that we did in our first meeting was create a syllabus. And so I had drafted a, bunch, a few different ideas uh, these are the different projects that we could do in the fellowship. I invited the fellows to change it if they wanted to. They actually decided that they want to do all the, the projects that I had uh, pre-created. And so then it was a, a matter of designating what weeks we would work on those projects and then what were tools that we could read and watch and learn from that would help us better understand these areas that we were exploring for the next month and a half. And so we created, pre-populated a whole syllabus that we then shared online for, and it's still accessible. Anyone could go to the syllabus, I believe it's in our Afrotopia's Instagram accounts bio, and you can go and you can find all these readings and just amazing um, work that is related to these different areas that we were exploring. And so, as I mentioned in the syllabus, there were weekly projects from designing culture rather than pedagogy for remote learning amidst poverty to Black Futures Manifesto to the future protests that uh, all of the fellows then brought in. They all shared their readings of different areas that they had learned from. And that was also just like building that syllabus was amazing because these people, we had only met each other for the first time. And uh, in about two hours into our meeting, we had created this whole syllabus. And creating that syllabus actually took maybe like 30 minutes to create the initial version of it. 
Um, but the fact that they could all, they, they, I think it was also for them just understanding the power of, for when it's curating that team, but the power of them and understanding that they had so much to contribute from day one. I think that really uh, excited their idea of agency within the space of understanding that they're in the midst of really amazing company that's thinking a lot like them, but also different enough to offer all these different tools and readings that they had never heard of and that they could come together so quickly and create something so robust in such a quick amount of time. And so um, another thing that I did with this Imaginarium Fellowship was, as I had conversations with all these different people that really wanted to be a part of this, but I didn't have enough money to create a fellowship for all these different people, it was about how can I make sure that other people can still benefit, especially the people that had applied and wanted to do this. And in having conversations with them, a big thing that I heard, a pretty universal thing that I heard between them was, they just wanted to have a space to talk about these sorts of ideas with uh, with people that look like them, people that think similarly to them, but also different enough. But just to have that kind of space, a lot of them were um, maybe the one Black student in their predominantly white institution or the one Black person at their company or just generally just was geographically was not in a space where people are thinking in this way. And they just wanted to be a part of something that could do that for them. And so with understanding that, it was then a matter of just creating that space. And that really doesn't create much, that doesn't really cost uh, much of anything. It might have to pay a little more for a Zoom subscription to let more people in. Um, and it just takes a bit of energy to create this and organize that. But that's just like a labor that I'm happy to do. So to exchange that that little bit of labor that I had to do to create these environments for people, uh, sometimes it was 50 to 70 people in a Zoom call for a couple hours on a weeknight, just coming together and ideating. And then another purpose of everyone coming together was they are building off the work that the Imagineers are doing and the Imagineers are building off the work that they are doing. So we would have these Imaginariums which are open to the black public online every Tuesday and they would uh, go through the research that the, uh, the fellows had already uh, shared and they would share their own ideas of what does it mean to create a Black Futures Manifesto, as you can see in the upper corner. And they would write down their ideas and then the fellows would take a look at that and we would gather on um, the weekend and we would build off the work that the, 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 black, the black public had done. And for one, it was also about making sure that the work that we're doing as a team of fellows is not insular. It's only 10 people. And as much as I try to create it as diverse as possible, that's still going to be a pretty insular group of people considering how um, it's meant to be reflective of an entire robust community of people. So um, that was that was a way to make it as little insular as possible and getting as many perspectives as the work that we were doing. And so it was incredible. These conversations were amazing, so inspiring. Um, and it, sometimes I got even emotional of just being able to have a shared space where people are coming together with all these different people that they had never met before and uh, talk about things that we never really had a space to do. And so, as I mentioned, the foes, we would gather on the weekends, we would build off of the work that the Imaginarium's done. I would also bring in a guest speaker, like here we have Raphael Smith, who's done incredible work. Um, he was at the time a design director at IDEO and is now working on the doodles at, uh, at Google. And he has a personal practice of just building these amazing speculative designs that are uh, really positively impacting the world. One of them was this idea of solar powered reparations. Uh, so creating these satellites that then could turn into a way to create some monetary gain in the form of reparations. And so after they hear uh, like these brilliant minds come in and they can have a conversation with them, then it was a matter of vision mapping of if we're in the week of designing something like pedagogy, what does that mean to build off the work that we had seen Raphael share, vision map it, uh, bring out our values, what are we trying to create? and then going into prototyping. And so I would give, we would break up into groups and I would give them a business model canvas just so we could flesh out the ideas as much as possible. And then I would turn their business model canvases into something visual that I would disseminate online um, that was reflective of what they were thinking and making it something that's easily digestible so that other people can use their thinking and build on top of that. And people that we never know, I may never know who looked at those posts, but it's more of understanding that that's being shared out into the world and, um, people are able to use that. And so an example of that, this would be a graphic that I'd created on the work that the fellows had done about pedagogy. And one of the groups had created a project on social and emotional transformation as a means to liberatory pedagogy. So what does it mean to be to create a whole pedagogical framework off of emotional intelligence and how that can impact the way that we are interacting in, in society? 
And so the fellowship culminated in each of the fellows writing their own essays. And these essays are incredible. Uh, they're also online in the bio for Africtopia, where uh, right here, Josie creates a, a, created a fellow uh, essay on a meditation on afro -Nowism. So uh, Josie uh, and I, we actually were part of a spiritual group together too, that was exploring just ways of uh, really engaging in a variety of forms of spirituality. And so it was amazing in the same summer. And so it was amazing to see her interest and the spiritual forms that we were learning in an entirely different community and bring that into the Afrotopia community and be reflective of the uh, academic work on afro Nowism and pull those two together to think about, you know, what does it mean to heal the power of healing through radical imagination? And so on the right, you see images of the other essays. Another one, Ya Ade wrote an essay on reimagining museums as portals, which is also a really exciting idea on thinking about how we often engage with museums as a form of archiving the past, but what if they could actually be a portal to the future? If it's not, you're seeing artifacts that have already existed, but you're seeing artifacts that could potentially leave in the future and have some sort of significance. And so after that, um, after that fellowship, it's Afrotopia has continued to morph and grow. It's been a fractal, another series of online programming for adults called Fractal Fet. And I came up with this name because for when I was reading the book by Ron Eglash on, uh, or had read that book um, by Ron Eglash on fractal geometry, which had really taken roots, had really been first discovered in Africa, first implemented in practice in Africa, in the continent of Africa and India. And fractal geometry is a really powerful uh, form of mathematics. And um, the history around it is also just very exciting of how these indigenous African people were using this form of computation that was so advanced that when European settlers would come onto the continent, they would see the, their work and think it's just immediately assume it was primitive, obviously through a racist lens, but to know that the work was actually based off such an advanced form of mathematics that it was incomprehensible to the visitors of the continent. For me, it's just mind blowing. And to then know that, um, to just know that it's it, it's been embedded from the very beginning of African cultural practices. And so considering how a lot of math education, um, especially in the US with students, it can often be such a difficult experience for black and brown people because they think it's not, they, they think it's not innate to them, that it's culturally, it doesn't align with who they are or racially, they're just unable to because they are black or whatever it is. And to understand that actually your this group, our community has been at the forefront of different mathematical advancements from the beginning, I think is a, a huge shift that needs to be realized more. And so creating this series of programming that is highlighting also the power of fractalizing. So I think about the artistic practice of how an artist can spend years engaging in so much research and creating and then returning to past work and creating off of that past work and constantly iterating. And that's a form of fractalization of it's the work, the way that they're manifesting themselves in our identities and these visual and sonic elements has a form of a fractalization of their practice and how amazing it could be to just put, create a stage for these people that so many people admire, whether it's, um, and I'll go into the people that joined us, but creating a stage for them to share and show behind the veil their work and their process and allow for Black people to learn about that directly from them uh, and celebrate that. FET being, you know, parties, celebrate the process of uh, artists and innovators and what they've learned. And so here are some of the presenters, like Susie Analog, who has an incredible force in the music industry, to Terrence Nance, who's an incredible force in the film world, to Legacy Russell, who's an incredible force in the art world, to Onyx Ashanti, who's an incredible force in an entire new world that he's creating um, on ways that we can reimagine just life uh, through this, these sounds and machine learning in a variety of other ways. Um, and so this is some of the, the uh, words that came out of the fractal fed. We had Annika, who uh, spoke about digital gardens, to Corday Jatapa Henry, who spoke about speculative filmmaking, um, and Ash Bacchus Clark, who spoke about neuroscience, and Legacy Russell, who spoke, who's also the writer of Glitch Feminism, and wrote, talked about um, just like unlearning this idea of human. And uh, after Topia has grown into even being a course, as, as I'm a professor at New York University, um, I brought Afrotopia to ITP. Um, and we got to learn a lot about 
the Afrotopian ecology, like what is the whole ecosystem? What is everything that's gone into the development of Afrotopia from Pan-African philosophies and studying people like Achille Mbembe and Stokely Carmichael, which I'll go into a bit, to designing prismatic futures, to building community, to fluid radicalism. I think Afrotopia as abundant as it has been um, and inspiring, it's also uh, unleashed a lot of uh, very critical ways that we need to think about radicalism and what does it mean to be radical and when is it productive and what it might actually be harmful. Um, so thinking about the, the variety of ways that uh, radicalism can be practiced. And so in this course, it was broken down to a few different sections, some being pedagogy, performance, and praxis. So Achille Mbembe and Paolo Ferreira are incredible minds. Paolo thinking uh, just a huge influence in the ped pedagogical world in Achille on performativity and uh, just like extremely exciting uh, praxis on um, being a human and, and, and living within the society that we do to studying the work of Marimba Ani on Yurugu, which is, uh, I would highly recommend this book to everyone really, because I think with the way that we understand anthropology, which is generally really the European and Eurocentric world going off into other countries and kind of observing them through their lens and defining them based off of their lens, Yurugu flips that relationship completely where it is then uh, uh, anthropology, but not through this Eurocentric lens, but actually it's, African people studying European cultures and the anthropology of that and what does that mean? And so I think this is incredible because it then allows, uh, even as a black person, for me to better understand the way that I'm engaging in the world because I've been so embedded in this, this society as all of us have. And to be able to look at this society through a lens that's kind of removed from that and to see what does it actually mean when we're doing this or what are we actually striving for? To studying the relationships between a variety of different people from Norbert Wiener and the creator, basically the basic creator of the cybernetic idea, uh, cybernetics to Sokli Carmichael or Kwame Turi on black power and pan-Africanism to Octavia Butler and slime molds and how uh, this I think is another example of the, the importance of cybernetics. Uh, and cybernetics is something that infiltrated a lot of the work that we were studying, similar to like Yurugu, which is a form of cybernetics and that anthropology being specifically of anthropology as a, cyber, a form of cybernetics and that there is a feedback loop of an observer and uh, the input and the output, but also understanding that there's an observer within this feedback loop. And um, when we understand there's an observer and that it's not just a siloed process, we understand that the way that we define this process is based off of the observer's perspectives. And so to bring in Norbert Wiener's understanding of cybernetics and work on that, to then also learn about Octavia Butler, who was studying a variety of different forms of science, but especially slime molds, where Octavia, being this queer black, being this black woman, um, looking at slime mold as a queer intelligence and not defining it in a binary form that a lot of her, uh, that a lot of other science uh, scientists do, where they kind of bring in their own perspective and they kind of confine the possibility of this being like slime mold based off of what they understand. And Octavia being very fragile, being very um, understanding of the fragility of uh, identity and. Um, a whole new way of understanding cybernetics. So technology and ethos, which I'm also was, I'm always excited to share this with the Aftotopia community of how Mary Baraka was thinking a lot about technology and even mentions uh, Norbert Wiener and this idea of machines and what it is actually mean. And what would it mean if um, black and African people were at the forefront of technological advancement uh, from the beginning? Like what would it mean if we lived in a world where we were enacting on the advancements of black and African people? Um, like how would our machines be experienced? to uh, Joy James. This is an incredible talk that Joy James gave at Brown University on the architects of abolitionism. So what does it mean to identify yourself as an abolitionist when you've never even been incarcerated, you've never been in the jail system, but you have that name, you're, you're, you're then being someone, a spokesperson of this it really, you know, it's a heavy and difficult experience and system to navigate. And so, you know, just this idea of activism in a way where we can have the best of intentions, but we can actually be very harmful with the way that we're doing it and the nuance of forms of activism. And so a variety of other uh, amazing uh, minds like Che Guevara and Thomas Sankara and how all of them have had, a, uh, how their work has had relationships between each other. Uh, and the relationship between Eastern, the Eastern world and the African world and the Pan-African world of how there was a, a huge relationship between um, you know, Black Panther Party and Asian leaders and a variety of other uh, Pan-African leaders and how there was a strong 
tie between them and understanding works like uh, the art of war and uh, the importance of being at the intersection of knowing your enemy and knowing yourself. And I think the art of war is a great uh, tool for anyone that's engaging in activism to do it in a way that's sustainable and actually impactful. Uh, so then that leads me to wrapping up Afrotopia in this talk with uh, a more recent project, which has been done through the New Forms Incubator. So right now I'm in the midst of this, we're in the midst of uh, building out this incubator. It's actually, I mean, it's built out, but we're in the midst of creating work through this incubator. And it's been a partnership between Afrotopia and New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program, which is the uh, program I came out of. And so the purpose of this has been to bring together uh, a few handful of artists to push past uh, the world that we're in and to think very critically about new worlds and designing based off that through an Afrocentric lens. And so these are the creators. We have Jeremy Kamal, who spoke at Fracto Fet and is a graduate of the GSD in uh, architecture and landscape architecture, and is thinking amazingly about uh, landscape design and music and sound and cultural relevancy. This is some of Jeremy's work. To Jordan Caldwell, who's a designer projector, uh, has done a lot of work in the music industry and really rethinking the ways that the music industry is enacted and rethinking the way that sound is enacted. Uh, Jordan created this uh, experience manifest and it was, I mean, I hadn't been to it, but she told me a lot about it. And it's just an incredible space to um, reimagine the experience, uh, the, for one, the relationship between the artist and the audience and the idea of performance and the consumption of audiovisuality. So Corday Jatapa Henry, who also spoke at Fractal Fet, who's a filmmaker and visual artist, uh, a trained architect, landscape architect, and thinks a lot about mythology and creates films based off these ideas of folklore and mysticism. And so these are some examples of Corday's work. And then I, I've also joined this team. Usually I'm a producer and directing Afrotopian initiatives. And so this one, I wanted to give myself an opportunity to get into the art and create with a team of people. And so I've been joining them and creating my own work, exploring a variety of different things. And it's also been an opportunity uh, that we've been doing in, in partnership with MIT Space Exploration Initiative. So we're working with the community uh, within the Space Exploration Initiative to get guidance on what does it mean if we um, shift from not only thinking critically about the world that we live in, but this extraterrestrial world. What might uh, space travel be like um, if we think about it in a spiritual lens and also through a Black and Afrocentric lens? And what can we create from that? And so our outputs, we've been exploring a variety of different ways, but uh, it's actually turning into a book. So we're going to launch an experimental book that's going to go on sale in a few months, um, which is going to be a compilation of research that we've done, which has been manifested into a variety of different forms of art, which is uh, super exciting. And um, what this incubator is rooted in is understanding that there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. And so uh, it's really important that the fellows and I, we operate understanding that it's not about creating the newest thing, but it's about understanding that we can create our entirely new worlds in which new things then exist within. So what I want to leave you all with is before we go into Q&A is that it's about always creating a space for imagination. It's manifestation. We can often kind of be confined to the world that we live in and following rules and following laws of physics and reality. But once we actually step out of that and we think about uh, this world beyond what we understand, we can actually manifest it by designing it so critically that everything is fluid. There are no silos. So a lot of my design practice and what like, Afrotopia has been is it's not about creating these silos of confining people to a certain discipline, but actually understanding that we can work together or you can be one being that's working in a bunch of different spaces and you can build off of the understandings of different disciplines to integrate into other disciplines and how there's a, a really amazing relationship between that. And to stay curious, I think for me, so much of the work has been, I'm interested in this and I'm just gonna go full force into learning about it and researching it and then create something based off of what I learned. So thank you and excited to answer some questions. Wow, thank you, Ari. That's uh, incredible and so inspiring. And just, you know, you're just really shifting paradigms and shifting mindsets and, and it's really, really exciting to see. Um, if you have any questions from the attendees, please put them in the Q&A and we can um, get to them. 
Um, but in the meantime, we have our panelists here. I don't know if anyone has any questions or wants to kick this off. Um, okay, William. Yeah, so first, um, my mind is blown. It's such amazing, such a spectrum of work. And it almost is, as though you embody the fractual as a as a kind of philosophy right as a as a modus operandi these projects just keep keep kind of morphing and splitting and um and i, I guess the question i mean what you're doing is incredible and um and and it's a question of scale like you're one human who's generated a huge amount of work how how can we get this in california and in toronto and in mexico city and you know how to how to scale this up do you have any thoughts about that uh, yeah, thank you. Very, very kind words. Um, I think uh, it's something that I've explored a lot. I think in, in first building out after Utopia, because the business models that I've seen traditionally is very much like you create something, if it's successful, you keep trying to build it out, you franchise it, you make it exist in other spaces. And um, I, I definitely tapped into that for a bit and thought, okay, the way that this can be the most powerful is by uh, creating this space in different cities and making it so that more and more people can attend the events. And then I realized it's similar to cooking of when you start to create dishes and you, you know, create it in bulk and you share it with a lot of people, it doesn't taste as similar as when you just create a special dish for a few people around you. And I think for me, it just felt more natural to not think so much about how can I, you know, uh, share this with the whole world and put myself in front of all these people, but it's actually more of this is just a really special practice of my own and it feels really good to do. And I like to do it within a specific group of people. You know, it's, a, it's an energy, it's a vibe and um, it's making sure that it, it's aligned forces and being okay with it not being everywhere and, um, and not feeling that pressure of having to grow and expand, but actually understanding that creating this experience for this group of people can ripple and they carry that experience and they can then fractal out and share with their group of people. And it can kind of be like a natural dispersion in that way, as opposed to, you know, thinking so much about um, that, that traditional form of power. And I see you've had a, a number of prominent corporate sponsors, Verizon, uh, Google, any, any hope that, that, for example, some of these things might be picked up more structurally by them? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fraught space, I know that, but, but um, they are, they do have a big footprint and they do have resource. And they, and I, I imagine some of them are trying to rethink their hiring practices, uh, which is one of their incentives maybe. But is there a way that some of this can be sort of sector to be picked? Well, as you just said, can other folks pick these ideas up? And uh, are you seeing any, any traction in that, in that space, in the corporate space? That's a, that's a great question. I know um, before I had even started working at Google uh, and we had our After Utopia, but a festival there um, in 2000, I think it was 18 or, uh, or 19 or 20, I can't remember, um, 19, we had a bunch of different presenters. It was at Google, people that worked at Google were there. And then now that I'm working there, I realized, uh, and just like going through different decks, I would see presenters that we had on the stage after Topia actually be a part of the research that uh, the Google team was doing. So for me, it's, it's not even something I'm realizing is happening. Like it's not an intentional thing. Um, it's kind of naturally happening. The stage is created and a lot of eyes are on it. People are looking at who's coming out of Africa Topia. But it's also for me, uh, again, I'm just staying true to who I am. And I think I went into Africa Topia in a very reactive mode. It was me understanding that the tech world is uh, racially, um, it's just so subpar racially as far as the diversity. And I want to challenge that. I want to make sure that companies are more uh, diverse and they're hiring us. And I was trying to create this sort of like hiring uh, tunnel, whatever. But then I realized that, that it, the people have always been there. That's not really something that I want to spend my energy doing. I don't want to solve the problems of this group of people. What I actually want to do is focus on my own community and how can I bring all these tools to them and create and realize their ideas and not you know, uh, dilute my energy in that way. And so uh, I think it's more of on these companies, uh, if they're interested in this, then they can then see, because everything is open source, everything is online. So if they're really invested, then it's on them to see everything that we've shared and build off of that. I'm curious, um, you know, with all this talk lately about the metaverse, which is about creating new worlds and 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 virtual worlds, um, how you're thinking about that, and whether you know you're you're thinking at all of sort of a 
Afrotectopia or a, a black, you know, lens on, on, on the metaverse? Uh, great question. Yeah, the conversations are endless on the metaverse. I actually have never, I haven't thought about that at all, of uh, bringing Afrotopia into the metaverse. I think um, right now we're just so focused on extraterrestrial world, which unfortunately already feels like too much of a luxury. The fact that there's so much going on on this planet that we're even, you know, focusing our attention on the whole new world. That's another thing. I, I, I mean, I'm still trying to understand my thoughts around the metaverse. And I, right now I'm not in the side, on the side of being the most excited about that being realized, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely coming. And um, I think it would be great to start thinking in that area, but I also, I'm, I'm not too much of trying to follow the different trends and ideas. And it's more of just what feels, you know, naturally most interesting. So to answer your question, simply no, I'm not really <laughs> making that connection yet. All right, Shrusti. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that talk. It was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my question is about how you look at, treat your own practice as an artist and the programming and the planning and organizing that goes into developing community and whether your source of creativity comes from your community or does it, are there at times where you have to carve out time to make your own stuff, right? To generate from a place of you and your, your own kind of whatever you're trying to do for the world and tell this. So I'm, I'm, that's not a very well thought out question, I guess, but, but does that make sense? And, and yeah, absolutely. What no, no, that, that's definitely a well thought out question. I think, um, with the, and that's something I've been learning on the go as I've been building this of, uh, I think for me, I'm just a very practical person. And so uh, even being an artist, it was understanding, okay, it's, it's very difficult to make uh, money off of your art. And I'm investing a lot of money, whether I'm, you know, going to school and all this stuff to be, to be in this art world. So how can I flip that and, you know, do something that is financially, uh, it puts me in a, a financially good position. So it would, it would make me or inspire me to do things like as opposed to purely focusing on creating art, I would then create tools for artists to create their art with, which is, look, oh, 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 that's an example of that. Of For me, it's an art practice, but I'm also thinking not so much about being a photographer, but I'm thinking about how can I make a business around photography, which is nice at times, but then when I started to realize that I was doing that a lot, I had to take a step back um, and really just you know move through that and figure out how I can do that more carefully or just protect my artistic practice more carefully. With Afrodictopia, um, it, for me, it's kind of like, if I have an idea, I do it like full force, do it without even thinking about how is it going to feel to do that. And Afrotopia has been an incredibly, uh, intensely labor, you know, a labor intensive kind of project, um, because it is really just me, you know, pulling all these different strings together and trying to, you know, get people to on the stage and do all this stuff. So, um, it's felt so removed for so long from being an art practice. And because it didn't feel like it was in our practice, it made me feel like it was actually draining a lot of my energy. Um, and because I felt like I was you know, too removed from the things that I actually wanted to do, even though I felt like it was impactful for people. But then it took a matter of just shifting the way that I was interpreting the work that I was doing and getting out of this idea of what a, an artist is. And an artist isn't purely someone that's putting you know, pigment to a canvas but they can actually be someone that's literally just creating an environment for certain kind of conversations or creating a space for someone to imagine in a certain way. And when I started to realize that, oh, this programming, this designing of an environment, these putting these two people together to have a conversation, that's actually a form of art. For me, it shifted and it felt a lot more like I, I was actually serving that, you know, that, that artistic soul of mine and not just someone that's outputting constantly. So I think it's, it's a mix of, you know, just reflecting very specifically on why are you doing the things you're doing as an artist? Like, is it purely for practicality? And also understanding that art has so many different forms. Thank you. Yeah. All right, looks like we have a question from uh, the attendees, Shell Evergreen. Uh, how would you hope white folks can learn from or support Afrotectopia? Um, I think, uh, so, I mean, for one, it's also just like all the work is out there, like it's all accessible. Uh, the syllabus is very robust. So before even, you know, asking, uh, I think for me, what I think about a lot is if you want to know something, you're going to take the time to learn it. Uh, I didn't know anything about modular synthesizers and I watched so many videos to learn it. I didn't know anything, you know, like everything that I'm doing, I didn't know anything about. So if you have that genuine interest, um, you're going to learn about it and you, you don't, no one, 
is born knowing everything. Black people are not born knowing everything about racial activism and the experience of being a black person. Everyone, whether it's lived experience or studying, and even as a black person, you can grow up and uh, not study and you know not be be completely oblivious to things like critical race theory and all those sorts of things. So I think it's understanding that everyone has to learn, and it's not so much about putting that extra burden of asking a community of people teach me but it's actually in the same way that you're interested in all these other things that you're interested in whether it's you know the stock market or whatever and you take the time to learn about that do that as well with um the you know critical race theory and all that sort of stuff all right um any other questions comments from the panelists david yeah there's a theme that I get in all of this incredible work, and that is the antidote to this capitalist malaise is art, and it, and and in particular imagination, because there's something about the importance of new ways of thinking about how we imagine, or imagining these alternative futures. Um, that seems so important and so urgent. And it seems to be like the only way, or at least one of the few ways I can imagine to get out of this current situation, right? Because part of the context that we're working in is that for some reason in this quote unquote capitalist world we live in, it's very difficult for us to even imagine an alternative to this particular economic system that we all take for granted, right? And, and your work really challenges that in uh, profound ways. And how might we move this forward? Or how are you thinking about uh, taking this forward? Um, Not really a question, but more <laughs> of a, tell me more about the imagination component. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think, I mean, number one is just creating that space for that. Uh, I think that's what, that's what really drew me to the academic world, specifically NYU, um, ITP, space because it's so much of you just as I've as I've created courses at ITP for a while and I'm just bringing in these different interests and creating a, a lens specific enough where we know we have some sort of shared language around the ideas but it's broad enough where they can really bring in their own interests and I think that's generally something that's pretty uh traditional of classroom environments though not always like some you know professors are very much of like you're teaching you want the students to perform in a specific way but I, but I think when you unleash that control and you really are just creating an environment for people to have a conversation around a shared understanding and encourage them really to be you know creative and to disagree with me like it's not so much about us being on the same page it's really a, a relationship of learning together and, and observing and challenging the world together i think that sort of does that at least in the academic world but um i think at the very beginning it's more of just creating that space i think personally for yourself um reimagining why you're doing the things that you're doing in a day or in a lifetime what your career is why you know what's the purpose of all of that um and and then uh kind of building off of there i think also for me as someone that has you know studied a variety of different practices and read a bunch of you know self-help books so much of the way that you think um and the things that you're consuming then control your your entire navigation through life and i think with imagination when you are actually kind of removing yourself from the world as it is and thinking a lot about this new world that you want to live in, whether you're designing a whole new school, even if you have never even taught a class, like you're just giving yourself that space to do this sorts of thinking. A lot of it subliminally is then uh, infiltrated into the way that you're being in your life and your research and the moves that you're doing. Um, so I think really just putting a power to something that may feel very abstract in that moment, but understanding that's impacting the decisions that you make thereafter. Um, so with this Imagineer uh, fellowship programs, was the collective thing they created was the syllabus, right? And then they also wrote essays. Was that sort of the... the yeah, outcome? so, yep, they wrote uh, that syllabus. Um, they also each wrote uh, essays and then each week they produced work where they did research and then they also shared uh, new, new realizations. So it was quick prototypes of we had one on um, future protests. So they created, they were always in groups of about three and they created three different versions of what might it mean for a future protest. So it could be 
an artifact from that research might be a series of notes from conversations that they had at the fellowship or they actually created something uh, I, I turned their research into something graphic which was shared on instagram those sorts of things but yeah for every week there was research and a culmination of that research output too and with the afrotectopia and the festival did you keep track of sort of how it impacted people after they left that festival and yeah. what happened? Like, I know there were businesses that were created and, and such. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, every every now and then, uh, especially if like, there was a new series of programming coming up or just a check in with the community, it would be uh, asking them, you know, what's up? What, what have you been able to do since meeting people at uh, the festival? Um, and some people would share, but really more of uh, my understanding of the impact of Arctotopia on people's lives have just casually come up in conversations. I might see someone that I hadn't seen since the last festival, or someone will tell me, oh yeah, this person is now working here because of the person I met there. So it, it's really, uh, I don't really get to hear too much, but when I do, it's um, it definitely is very significant. Um, there is another question coming in from Francesca of Brezzi. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the culture of this Zoom space for your projects in 2020? I worked with a group around the same time, um, street dance activism, and we had a powerful connection even though we were remote. It seemed like you had a similar experience with your project group. The expectation was that the pandemic isolated us, and it did, but there were moments like these where it seemed to allow for these digital spaces to foster new community and creative and supportive connections. What benefits and drawbacks have you seen of building a digital community? Uh, do you expect these digital communities to be sustainable? People often assume digital makes it easier, but the coordination time and effort are in reality the same, if not more than if you were meeting in person. How do you find balance? Yeah, incredible question. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it was definitely in a moment where people were very disappointed. We can't gather in space together. And um, it was a huge cultural shift uh, in the very early stages of that cultural shift. Um, but for me, as, as you have already seen, uh, I just saw it as such a great opportunity for more people that just were not in you know this hyper-local New York City space or whatever to engage in the work that we were doing because there was constant interest in taking after Utopia to other parts of the world. And so um, I think the benefits of that happen that the door has opened for a lot of people. It's not about being in a certain city. You can actually just open up your computer as long as you have decent access and the technology to do so. You can open up your device and, and you can join communities that you would never have been able to before. Um, and I think just that ability to kind of be in your own living room or in your own space and to be in communion with people that are from very different spaces is a huge benefit of now you're able to uh, share all these different resources and understandings. Even thinking in the academic world, um, people are able to teach courses at universities very far from where they live because right now uh, some universities are open to online teaching, which also really expands the opportunities for students to learn from people very different from the immediate community. Um, I think drawbacks to it have been, for one, just the access, especially if you're trying to work with an extremely underserved community, like um, people that just don't have access to the technology or broadband or um, just that personal connection, like now being a professor and teaching in person, it's an entirely different experience that I didn't realize how much I missed versus having taught online and uh, that loss of energy exchange that you can't do through a computer screen. But I think just building community is a really specific, uh, it's really important to understand how different that is when you're doing something online, especially when you're trying to create a safe space for uh, a racial racialized group of people and how that then requires, and something I had not really thought too much about before doing this, because this was really the first, I think online, one of the first uh, Fractal FET was, uh, or there was, I think there was another online programming that we had um, but oh, the, the Imagineer Fellowship was the first online exclusive to Black and Pan-African people online event that we had, and that went completely fine. Uh, but then when it came to Fractal FET, there were moments where it was this idea of self-identifying yourself as a Black or Pan-African person and the surrounding community, online community, agreeing with you. And this can come from, you know, phenotypes and skin complexion and those sorts of things of some people can consider themselves as a part of the community while others look at them and don't and how that can create a, a really big tension for a group of people and understanding that you need to have policy and uh, 
you know, uh, rules around that? What does it mean when there are disagreements between a community that's around something so sensitive and how to handle that? And I think that that definitely came to the forefront with uh, some of the programming. And it, it really made me understand that I have to be a lot more intentional about the spaces and how they're being presented online. And then also um, with digital environments, with Afrodictopia, it's always been, uh, what I've generally always heard is that people have experienced just a really great time. They, it's energetically, they feel really fulfilled. They're around people that just feel like, um, you know, we're, we're all aligned and we're respectful towards one another. But when you are entering a community for the first time, not in that shared space environment where you're, you're able to energetically feel the people around you, but it's purely through a computer screen and who knows what kind of day you've had. We're also in the midst of a lot of political turmoil. A lot of that's gonna come into the space. And so when you're entering a community um, that's already so fragile in their, their experience um, and you don't know the essence and the vibe of that community, a lot can also be changed of uh, just your experience within that community. And I think, um, you know, it, it's something that could easily be alleviated. People also act differently online and behind a computer screen than they would in person. So I think there are things like that that you have to really figure out. How can you make sure you're creating a space that's conducive and respectful and healthy for everyone while having to navigate, you know, this relationship online, but also understanding that it's an amazing opportunity to open the door to so many people. So it's a balance I'm still trying to figure out. I think one of the ways that I've explored it is by um, this idea of scaling, of not being so in a rush to scale and make something huge, but to understand that um, that can actually cause a lot of unhealthy circumstances for people because so much, so much is coming into that space versus if you really, you know, create very intimately with people and you get to know them well and you're occurring a shared space in that way, how, how that can be actually more impactful. You clearly have a lot of talent in so many areas including i mean create you make it sound easy but creating spaces and especially when you're bringing in people who um come from you know have different languages they come from different fields you know and and you know i, I imagine it's it's it, it takes you know, it's quite a process to get you know to have people come up with something collective you know and and really understand each other and how do you put yourself in the middle of all that how does that work I think, uh, and thank you, uh, very kind words. I think it's, um, you, you listen a lot. Like uh, with everything that I know, I've learned it, whether it's from really beautiful experiences or really painful experiences. Like, um, you know, you're learning a lot on the go. And with Afrotopia, I'm learning in front of so many people and I'm making mistakes in front of a lot of people. So I think it just requires that humility and that ability to place yourself in risky situations, but understand that you don't have to take yourself so seriously. Everyone is learning and growing and people are learning and growing by watching you learn and grow. And so I think just that, that general ability to be uh, humility, the, the humility and to see yourself purely as just a vessel like Afrotopia is, you know, I, I really just find myself as a vessel for all of these different ideas from being around different people and, you know, learning from my community to uh, just, you know, intuition and all those sorts of things. And it's, it's bringing those together and not putting it into something for people else. Amazing. All right. Do we have any other um, questions or comments from the panelists? I think I got the Q and A. Oh. Um, well, we, we have a few minutes left. I'll just go and ask you another question. I was curious too, you said about, you know, you have to also worry about the dangers. Like you're saying, yes, you know, just try, no one's perfect, but also, you know, think about the dangers of being an activist or, you know, you said abolition when you haven't been in prison and, or imagination even, we think that's only can be positive, but it can be negative too and dangerous. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you can have the, the one thing that uh, my coworkers and I at Google, we talk about all the time is the road to hell can be paved with good intentions. So we can try our hardest to create something that's beautiful and, and, and possibly impactful. But if we are not uh, comprehensive in our understanding and our research and our you know understanding of a problem, we can actually enact a lot of harm. And so um, I think as much, but but even with that harm, like um, I think it's always something to learn from. Everything is creating an opportunity for people to learn from. Of oh, that's that's something you definitely never want to do or repeat. Or um, hopefully it goes in a positive direction. But I think, um, yeah, I think there's a 
as important as imagination is and as taking risk, there, it also always comes with, with the level of responsibility, especially when you know it's gonna impact a lot of people. And I think being cognizant of that responsibility always of double checking and triple checking and quadruple checking um, is essential. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ari. We're all incredibly impressed with how much you're doing. And someone here said a wonderful artistic path, so collective and social. So both your individual path and the collective work you're doing, it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you to all the panelists and the attendees. Um, we will be gone for the next two weeks, but we'll be back in three weeks with um, Ja Diamazi from Mass Design Group, who's working on interesting um, memorials and think reconceiving memorials. All right, thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks.